And so, uh, I'd like to begin with, uh, I'm going to begin where, where we're going to end, really, with the slides. And that is in a place called Caesarea Philippi, which shows up in Scripture in Matthew chapter 16 beginning with verse 13. And I know this is a, a place that uh, you're very familiar with in Scripture. So it reads, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. What I never knew before, and what really stuck in my mind when we were at Caesarea Philippi, was that the site where Jesus said these words was in front of three pagan temples. We'll see the ruins of them toward the end of this presentation. But one of those temples had at the back a cave into which a river was flowing and that that cave was known at that time as the gates of Hades or the gates of hell. So that when Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it, he's actually pointing at, I would imagine, that temple and the cave behind it which was known by those people as the gates of hell. So what's he saying? Unbelief, paganism, demonstrated by the temples, will never overcome the message of the gospel that he brings. And, and you know, that's the kind of thing that sticks in your mind. Because I thought, well, sure, gates, uh, gates of hell, that always meant something. But now I've got a better idea of what it was that Jesus was actually saying. I'm going to start by... Uh, now you can turn off the lights. In 2018, uh, I, I never did much traveling internationally. I've been to Canada, but I, does that really count? No. no, I don't think so. So, But in 2018, I had the chance in retirement to be the temporary vacancy pastor at the English-speaking congregation in Frankfurt, Germany. They were without a pastor. They were having retired people come for 90 days or less because if, you have, if you're there any longer than that, then you have to go through a lot of uh, work visas and so forth. So it, my wife and I were there for 10 weeks. And that was just such a marvelous experience that it kind of overcame my fears of international travel. And so there was one other place I always wanted to go, and it was to Israel and see what the Holy Land really looks like. Um, but I told my wife, but the only, one, the only way I'll ever get there is if I go with a tour that is run by Nabil Noor. And my wife happened to see on Nabil's website that he had one coming up in September of 2019, and that's when I convinced my two buddies and myself to go on this trip. Who's Nabil Noor? He was probably the, uh, the most interesting seminary student I ever taught when I taught for 13 years at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Nabil was born in Nazareth. He was raised in Haifa. He was raised uh, in, in the Catholic Church. He emigrated, he's a Palestinian Catholic. He emigrated to the U.S married a Missouri Synod Lutheran and found himself at the seminary as a seminary student. Since graduation, he has been serving for over 20 some years now as a pastor in uh, South Dakota in the Sioux Falls area. 
And he's also become the third, the fifth, and now he's serving as the fourth vice president of Synod. This guy has got twice the personality of any ordinary human being. And I thought, if and, and every year he takes a group to Israel. So, well, probably not this last year. You know why. Yeah. But uh, he, he takes a group. So, if you ever want to go, this is the guy to go with because he just has such a marvelous presentation. So, uh, this is Nabil right here. And there we all are wearing our special t shirts so we don't get lost. <laughs> but that's when we're still in Chicago before we fly out to Istanbul. So we flew to Istanbul and then caught another flight to Israel from Istanbul. That's a long flight. I hate long flights. I despise long flights. So I don't think I'm ever going back to Israel. <laughs> but that's what it looks like. And so we're going to be going to Israel. Um, and going along with me was Dr. Tim Mashby from CW, Dr. Tom Firetop, Pastor Hogarth from Benediction in Milwaukee, and then a friend of ours by the name of Bill Locke. So we got to the hotel that we were staying at the first night in Bethlehem. The next morning I looked out the hotel window and that's what it looked like. And on the first day, we were going to go into Jerusalem itself. Now Jerusalem today is a huge city. But the old city of Jerusalem is divided into four quarters. There's what's known as the Christian Quarter, the Armenian Quarter, the Muslim Quarter, and the Jewish Quarter. And then here is the Temple Mount. So on the first day, again, this is what it looked like out the window of our hotel. Uh, this is the courtyard in the, in the center of the hotel. Very nice, very nice place. This is the exterior of the hotel in Bethlehem. But you know, Bethlehem is a Palestinian town, so that means that it's walled in. The Palestinian areas are all behind walls. And uh, to get in and out, you have to go through checkpoints. Now because we were American tourists on tour buses, we just drove right through. But if I was a Palestinian, it might take me quite a bit of time to get out of Bethlehem and into the other parts of Israel simply because of the restrictions that are placed on the Palestinians. And so this is what the wall happens to look like. <laughs> I have to tell you this. There was another one of these guard towers that it, it, uh, on it somebody had painted Trump Tower. <laughs> <laughs> We went to the Mount of Olives first, and so this is what uh, what you see looking across the Kidron Valley to this old city of Jerusalem, and of course where the temple once stood, the Temple of Solomon, then the Temple of uh, Herod, the second temple, is now the Dome of the Rock Mosque. It's actually not a mosque. There's actually a mosque on the Temple Mount. It's further to the left. It's the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The Dome of the Rock has is, is got a different kind of term given to it, so it's not technically a mosque. But yes, that is a, that is a gold, gold dome on it. From the Mount of Olives there, um, we, and, and just about every place that we went, Pastor Noor had a devotion for us. There were also seven pastors total on the tour, so each of us got a chance to do a devotion as well when we were there in Israel. But this is Pastor Noor leading the devotion as we were observing the city of Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley. And this is what an olive tree looks like. They really are pretty scrubby looking trees. I mean, you're, you're not going to get a lot of lumber out of an olive tree. But, pardon me? Not straight lumber. Not straight lumber, no. So you know, when, when you, you can buy all these different nice carved artifacts in olive wood, and, and that's why, that's what you can do with olive wood, is make those kinds of artifacts. And this is a fig tree. So if you've ever wondered what a fig leaf looks like, or how suitable fig leaves would be for clothing, you can take a look at that and realize that uh, Adam and Eve were in, pretty limited in their creativity. They, that, that was not going to cover them for very long. Much of the hillside of the Mount of Olives, however, consists of cemetery. And this is what's on the other side of the wall. These are all cemetery sarcophagi, uh, tombs. 
of uh, the people. What's interesting about those tombs is that because of the heat, uh, no one brings flowers to put in a cemetery. The flowers are going to be wilted within 15 minutes. But what people do is they put stones on top of each of those grave sites when they visit so that people know that there has been a visit made. And here's another picture of the, uh, the hillside. So you wind up going down this steep hillside, down the Mount of Olives, into the Kidron Valley, and then up to the old city. And that was the route you would recall on Palm Sunday that Jesus took, was going down the Mount of Olives and up into the city. So you can see it, it really is a, a very steep hillside heading down uh, toward the Kidron Valley. This is a picture of the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, as it looks today. Still has olive trees, and, and there's one olive tree in particular that they believe is, is about 1,500 years old. So it comes closest to the actual time of Jesus. Remember that the name Gethsemane itself, the, the name means olive press. That's what Gethsemane means. So, of course, it's, it's taking care of the olive crop in that area. Another thing we did the first day was we went to what's known as the upper room, which everybody knows is not the upper room. It could, Jerusalem has been destroyed several times since the days of Jesus. So if what, the best they can say is they think this is possibly the site where the upper room would have been. But today, if you were to actually find the upper room, it would probably be about 20 feet down because of all of the wreckage and, and uh, from, from the various wars and things that have taken place. And so you go into this area for the upper room, and uh, oops. I mean, that's, that's the size they have of the upper room. It's, yeah, it's beautiful. Um, at some point, it is also being used as a Muslim worship area. It's not being used for that purpose now. It holds about 150 people easy. And so it's not at all what I imagined the upper room to look like, does it? No. No, uh, I think some of the other uh, Hollywood depictions of, of The Last Supper do a much better job of giving you an idea of what, what the upper room would actually have looked like. But this is where they take the tourists. Then we went to a church called uh, St. Peter Galakantu. Galakantu means chicken crowing. <laughs> Put this together, you know what we're talking about. So they believe that this is the site where uh, the house of Caiaphas was located. So after Jesus' arrest, which took place in the Garden of Gethsemane, which you just saw, Jesus was taken to the home of Caiaphas. That was the first place that he was. And um, as they were digging, they found that the uh, the house of Caiaphas, and by the way, that's a, that's a church that was built on top. Oh, I didn't tell you this. <coughs> no biblical site looks like it did at the time of Jesus because one of the things they did almost immediately in the first centuries after the time of Christ, earthly ministry, was to build churches on top of every site. So when we get to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you're not going to see a cave. You're going to see a huge church that's built on top of the cave. Likewise, when we get to Bethlehem and look at that, it's a huge church that's built on top of the place where people believe it took place. So, Below this building here, and it's a beautiful sanctuary on the inside of this church, which was built in the 1960s, is a dungeon. There's, yeah, Caiaphas, the high priest, you know, he's, he's technically, you've got the Romans and the high priests, and they're kind of governing the country somewhat together. So in his basement, what does he have? He's got a dungeon. And this perhaps was the place that, uh, that touched me the most on the whole tour because of the, uh, the authenticity of it. If Jesus had been arrested you know, late in the evening at the Garden of Gethsemane 
And they had to pull together um, various high priests and others in order to question Jesus and have a trial. And this is all taking place in the dead of night. Where did they keep Jesus during that period of time? Well, if it's in the house of Caiaphas and he happens to have a handy dungeon in the basement, they had to put him in the dungeon. And uh, this was really the only place where I had chills going down my spine in the whole tour. Because if you notice up on top, they, there's, there's holes in the wall and ropes coming down from the holes. What were those for? Hands. To tie the prisoner. And that if that indeed was the place where Jesus was located prior to his trial before the Sanhedrin, that's where he would have been held. So it's um, a <coughs> pretty moving, moving sight. Now there are archaeologists who say, no, it's not the house of Caiaphas. His was about 20 yards further up the hill. Well, I, at this point, who knows? But this is the walkway that leads up the hill. So even if this isn't the actual site of the house of Caiaphas, and his house was 20 yards further up the hill, Jesus would have been walking on those stones. Well, then the next day was Sunday. And by the way, this is another courtyard at this hotel in Bethlehem, which is really very nice. And by the way, we ate enormous... The food that was available was tremendous. However, Dr. Firetog, who'd been a missionary in the Philippines and who's taken many, many student tours around, with students with, on tours to different mission sites, he warned me, said, just eat chicken and rice. Because <laughs> <laughs> you'd take students and, and they'd try everything and of course they all got sick. So I never got sick the whole trip because I ate mostly chicken and rice, even though there was this magnificent spread available at all these hotels. So that next morning we went to a place called Shepherd's Field. This again is in Bethlehem. And uh, uh, this is at a place where uh, shepherds would have actually kept their sheep. There's caves up in these hills. And uh, we found ourselves going into one of these caves, which would have at one point held shepherds and their sheep in Bethlehem uh, for a worship service since it was Sunday morning and we had a worship service in the cave and I had a chance there to actually read the gospel lesson as part of the service. So this would have been the area where the angels would have appeared to the shepherds on that first Christmas night. And then we went out for another fabulous meal. And you're thinking, wow, look at all those different things. Those are not the entrees. Those are just the salads that are out there before the entree comes. The entree to this, on this day was something special that uh, Nabil Noor had concocted with the uh, owner of the restaurant. And there's some kind of chicken dish in there. And in just a moment, he's going to flip it over, which he did without losing it all. Uh, now this is uh, Dr. Mashke on the left, Dr. Firetog in the center, and myself, as we then went, uh, following dinner, to uh, the Dead Sea Scroll Museum. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1947 and subsequent years as well. We're going to look at that a little bit later. But at this museum they have a layout of the old city of Jerusalem as it would have looked in the days of Jesus. So this is the Temple Mount. This is the temple here. This is the rest of the city. This is Herod's uh, palace over on this side. The actual area that was involved in the city of David, when David became king, you know, and moved the capital from Hebron to Jerusalem, the city of David is just this little strip area here. It's about 10 acres. That's all the larger the city was at that time. In fact, at this point, you're still talking about a city that's probably like 180, 200, 200 acres max. This is not a big area in the old city. But that uh, is a recreation model of what the temple would have looked like and the courts around the temple. And this was the uh, uh, model of the Antonia uh, fortress, fortress that was located um, on one corner of the Temple Mount. So this is where the Romans would be hanging out in order to make sure that everything was done in order 
and to keep control of the city. Right next to that model is the, uh, this is the roof of the museum of the Dome of the Rock uh, uh, for the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you'll notice there's water squirting on it. Mm -hmm. That's part of its air conditioning system. Mm -hmm. Right on the opposite side of, and, and by the way, that's shaped in the, that's in the shape of the top of the kind of jars in which the scrolls were kept. Oh. So they were long cylindrical jars, and that was the cover that would go on the jar. And right next to it on the opposite side was this big black monolith. And the symbolism there was supposed to be you've got the white purity of God's word, and then here this is to represent uh, the evil and, and what's wrong with the world on the opposite side. They didn't allow us to take any pictures in that museum, by the way. This is the Church of the Annunciation, of, of the Visitation, which is also there in, in Bethlehem. The Visitation is when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. And remember what happens when the two of them meet. The unborn John the Baptist leaps in Elizabeth's womb. So this is a church dedicated to that. And uh, so this is um, against... Traditionally, the site where the two of them met at a well. Um, on the left, you have a picture of the church on the inside. On the left, on the right, you have one of the monks from that area. And I just thought it was interesting that he's busy on his cell phone. <laughs> Another thing that really surprised me was the topography of the land itself. This is a view from that church of the visitation looking out across, and for whatever reason, I just thought it was more rolling countryside. Yeah. You know, that the shepherds would have been on rolling countryside, like we've got here in the mm -hmm. Kettle Moraine Forest, or something like that. No, it's not that way at all. It's, those, those hills are quite steep, and uh, just about all of them are terraced. And on the one that we're looking at here, you can see it's terraced, and then what do you put on the terraces? Olive trees. <laughs> Just makes sense that that's what you've got. The next day on Monday, and by the way, that's another picture outside the window of our hotel in Bethlehem, and that's a minaret from a Muslim mosque. And yes, early in the morning and at night, they make a lot of noise. <laughs> they do. The next day, we went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So again, this is the old city. The picture from the Mount of Olives was from here, looking this way. And now today, uh, this day, we're going to go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is the, the tomb where Jesus was buried and from which he rose from the dead. Um, and we're going to look at the Via Della Rosa, which goes from where Pilate's uh, at the Castle Antonio, Fortress Antonio, the Via Della Rosa would go from here down to here, and then uh, we're going to see the Wailing Wall, which is the best remains of, of the temple, Herod, Herod's temple, that the Jews consider their most holy site. So here we are, and by the way, the, the walls around the city right now are were built uh, built in the 15, 1500s. So they are, those walls are not all that old. The guy uh, in the blue shirt is our leader, and again, we've got our pink shirts on so we don't get lost in the crowds. Um, that's a picture of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre from a distance, an aerial view. And you'd, you'd think you're going to see this cathedral, if, but you can't really see the church building because it's surrounded all around it by other buildings. So... What you really see is the doorway going in. And as you enter it, you come upon this slab. Um, and this, by tradition, is where they prepared the body of Jesus for burial, where it was washed. And so when we entered it, there were a number of people kneeling before it, kissing it, and so forth, doing various aspects of, of devotion for um, this slab. Then you go into the center and there's a huge dome, and below the dome is something called the Edicule. Um, and uh, 
Again, I told you that they always built over every site. Mm -hmm. So this is where the cave was located. And really, of, of any of the events that we visited, this has the most likelihood of actually being the site itself. They're saying this is like 98% sure that this is where it would have happened. And that's because they can actually trace back this site from what early Christians did with it to what uh, the Emperor Trajan did by knocking it over and building a pagan temple on it in order to suppress Christianity, in order to what Constantine's mother Helena did when she came and then um, built a church on the site. So it has a historical record that takes you back to that, uh, that point in time. The edicule itself was restored about four years ago. It was falling down. National Geographic has, a, has something you can watch on, um, on Prime, if you happen to have Prime, that talks about the restoration. And they thought that the cave was completely leveled. When they, got it, when they took it down, they discovered that the sides of the cave were still there within this, this building. But there were crowds of people around this. Uh, this group was from the Philippines. Behind us was a group from Eastern Europe. Uh, it was just a very international <clears throat> group of tourists that were there. And we were all going around the edicule, and it was getting narrower and narrower and narrower as we went around it. And the reason for that is that eventually you come around the backside, and then you get to go in the front door. But they only put five people in at a time because that's as many as can get in there at a time. And then you're in there for 15 seconds. <laughs> and then they ring a bell and your time's up and you've got to get out. <clears throat> so that's, that's what we did. And there you can see the doorway leading in. And uh, <clears throat> here's a picture that I got off the internet that had, uh, you can see that as you go in it looks like a baptismal font. And I think that has been used in that way. But then there's an interior room, and again, it only fits about five people at a time. Then we went on the Via Della Rosa, walking from place to place. Um, this is where, if you're familiar at all with the Stations of the Cross, there's 14 Stations of the Cross, so they are marked along the Via Della Rosa. This is where Jesus would have carried the cross from his condemnation out to Golgotha. We were actually walking it backwards because we were starting at the tomb, which is also where <coughs> Calvary is supported to have been. And along this Via Della Rosa, <laughs> interesting things that you can purchase. I mean, <coughs> it's very narrow in some places, and it really is a, like a mall going through there. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, <coughs> this is this is interesting because it's got Green Bay Packers in Hebrew letters. <laughs> and likewise here you've got Wisconsin badges in, in Hebrew letters. That's just <laughs> Dodgers, Cubs. Yeah, I don't I, I, it is a tourist place. That's no doubt about that. Did you buy one of those? <laughs> no, no I didn't. No, I, I mean, there's only so much stuff you can fit in your suitcase on the way back. Cordia Collins. No, he would have made it. He would have made it. He would have made it. Pardon? You say you should have put a Concordia College emblem up there. Yeah. Yeah. We could have. Uh huh. On the Via della Rosa, this happens to be a tiny little chapel off the roadway, which is again purported to be the place where Simon Cyrene, Simon of Cyrene, took the cross for Jesus and carried it the rest of the way. Then we found ourselves at the Wailing Wall. Again, as I mentioned, one of the most holy sites for the, uh, the Jewish people. Um, and to go in, you had to ceremonially wash your hands. But to do that, you had to use these little flagons. And that's because you can't wash one hand and then wash the other hand because these, this hand is dirty, so that still made this hand dirty, and you're, you're never going to get it clean. So, You've got to use the flagon and pour it over your hands, and that way you can be ritually clean. You also need to wear a, a cap, so if you don't have one, they'll give you a little skull cap to wear if you go into this area. I had my Concordia University 
uh, baseball hat. So I was, I was good. Is, is the Wheeling Wall a remnant of the wall of the Second Temple? Or? Yes. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it so special because it's the last uh, remaining element from that Second Temple. So it takes them back to that place. And that's a picture of the wall. It's divided into two areas. On the left is the area for men. On the right is the area for women. They don't go into the same areas. They're, they're separated. Now, we're not in that right now because you can see here's a lady and, and there's some men. But once you get into that special, special area, which we did, and then off to the far left, there's, there's an opening and a cave-like area. And we went into, oh, well, before I talk about that, um, pious Jews will, will take petitions and scraps of paper and wedge them in between here uh, with their prayers. And then um, many of them, of course, were making a, a prayer motion as they were there in front of the wall, which is kind of a constant going back and forth. Going in that area that I was mentioning off to the left was uh, actually there was, uh, there was a catechism class going on. And they were repeating back and forth uh, the students to their teacher. And it was a very rote learning. He would say a phrase and they would shout it back. It was very loud, too. And this was the learning process that was going on. By the way, you may recall that in the Old Testament it says to uh, put God's word into phylacteries and put it on your forehead and, mm -hmm. and on your arm. And on... Well, this gentleman right here has one of those phylacteries on his forehead. Which I thought was, again, pretty, pretty interesting. There were several uh, sacred uh, scrolls of the Old Testament that they had in special containers there at that spot, and they would take them out. Um, they were also celebrating some bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs taking place that day we were there. And as we were exiting the Wailing Wall area, we ran into one of the parties. Now, for the uh, bar mitzvahs, they would... Uh, you know, they, they'd carry the adolescent around, and they'd have a little uh, tent that they'd hold over the, the child uh, on four corners. But to make this really something special, there would also be a band that they'd have, usually about four different instruments. They'd be a saxophone, a, a trumpet, a clarinet, and, um, and, and they'd be dancing all around. And, and our whole group wound up, they were coming this way, we were going this way, so we kind of meshed into it. And uh, Nabil, our leader here, he, he got right into the dancing. He invited us and he went in, in the dancing, and he did. Boy, he, he really got involved. I also, people have asked, well, were you, were you ever scared for your safety while you were there? You know, um, and the answer was really no. It was only at the Wailing Wall and one other, other site that we ever saw any soldiers. But um, Nabil told us that there are more plain clothesmen in those sites than there are soldiers that, that you would see. And uh, they're armed, ready to deal with whatever might happen. And I noticed that uh, when this party was going by and uh, the saxophone player was kind of swinging around, uh, as he swung around he had a pistol on his side. He was one of the plain clothesmen. Yeah. I, mean, I thought that was... Uh... No, I... I... Feel safe, I felt safer there than I would if I were in certain parts of uh, Chicago. Or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Then we went to the uh, Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, which is really interesting because to get in, that's the door. Uh, it's very low. The reason, and, and it was. Uh, this is the oldest Christian building that's there. Everything else that you find has been built since. And the reason this wasn't destroyed in the 600s when the Persians swept through, just before the Muslims swept through, is because on the outside of the building there was artwork depicting the visitation of the wise men. And they were dressed in Persian garb. So when the Persians came in and saw that, they thought, oh, this is a building for us, so they didn't destroy it. They lowered the door, though, in the, in the 1500s in order to keep animals out. Camels and, 
and horses. And, and again, that was that was much later. This is the interior of the Church of the Nativity. It's just gorgeous. And on the sides, there is uh, the remnants of fifth century, uh, really Greek Orthodox mosaics. And they're, they're just beautiful. There's, you can see what they look like. The fact that they have uh, <laughs> the girders up in top. These these are originals. That's amazing that they're still that the, that, that ceiling is still up there <laughs> after all these years. Then you you go down several steps, about eight steps down below the altar area in the church, and that's where they have the the site, traditional site where Jesus was born. And uh, you see it's down here, and then this is a close-up of a uh, star that they played. There's 14 different points on that star. Do you have any idea why there's 14? Beginning of Matthew, you have the genealogies, and it lists 14 generations from Abraham to 14 generations, 14 generations, three sets of 14 generations. That's why, if you ever put this together, put 14 points on the star. This, by the way, again, these are all the pastors who are on the trip. Mm -hmm. Then the next day we headed down to uh, Masada. You've heard about Masada? Mm -hmm. It's this fortress that Herod built on the Dead Sea. This is the place where in 72 AD the last of the Jewish revolt was holding out against the Romans. I'll tell more of the story as we go along. It didn't end well for the Jewish uh, revolt. When you look at a map of the Dead Sea in your Bible, if it has maps, it's going to look a lot larger than it does today. This is actually a, a Google Earth picture of the Dead Sea today. And you'll notice that this center part is actually now dry land. And the southern part is being used for industrial purposes because they're getting the chemicals out of the Dead Sea. And uh, yeah, it's shrinking. Now, it's, uh, for several reasons. There's a constant evaporation that's taking place, that's one thing. But the amount of water coming in from the River Jordan in the north has been decreasing because of the irrigation that's been taking place. <laughs> okay, somebody needs help. <laughs> Sometimes that happened on the trip, too. Yeah. <laughs> so here we are at sea level, and the Dead Sea is like 1,200 feet below sea level. And there you are looking across the Dead Sea to Moab and Edom on the other side of the Dead Sea. So you get the size of this. You know, Sometimes you might think, well, it's going to be like Lake Michigan across there. Well, no, you actually can see the other side. Yeah. Again, here's another picture of... Uh, of the Dead Sea as you look at it. And you can see where it prior, it, 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 it had been up at least this far in prior centuries. Masada is this hill fortress. To get to the top of it, you have to take a ta cable car. You can walk it if you're uh, a masochist, but <laughs> <laughs> we took the cable car and we headed up there. And it, it, you can just see how how useless this land is around there. It's just, there is nothing on this property. Um, we get to the top of it, and sure enough, there's a magnificent fortress up there. The Jews were holding out up there, and uh, the Romans couldn't stand the idea that anybody finally was holding out. They had to find a way to destroy those Jews who were holding up. And what they decided to do, uh, by the way, Herod built this beautiful fortress up there, and that's a model that's reconstructed of it. Here you can see again, the fortress was up here, and that went down along here, and then that's the Dead Sea in the distance. Um, and to this day, the camps of the Romans are still visible. So from the top, looking down, those squares are the uh, Roman camps that they had in order to uh, fight against the Jews. Now, what they, they discovered they just could not dislodge the Jews from the top of this mountain. So what they decided to do, oh, by the way, this, this was the post office. For the, 
that's an aviary. That's where they kept the pigeons, the passenger <laughs> pigeons. So it, was, it actually did serve as the communication system. It was the post office. So what did the Romans do? The Romans built a giant ramp. It took them months. But this is the remnant of the ramp. And this is the edge of the ramp that comes up. And then they dragged a huge siege tower up that ramp. And they started to batter against the fortress. The Jews who were there realized that the Romans were going to get in. And so the, day bef the, the night before the Romans were going to give their last push and batter down the wall and run, run in there and destroy them, all the Jews committed suicide wow. rather than allow the Romans to take them prisoner. Wow. That's the story. When we left Masada and went down to the Dead Sea to a place called Ben Gedi, and it's a resort because the Dead Sea has some medicinal purposes for certain skin diseases and people will go down there and just soak in the, in the Dead Sea. The fun part about the Dead Sea is you can't sink in it <laughs> because it's full of so many new, uh, chemicals and uh, it's so much salt that's in it that you, you just don't sink. So uh, there's a picture of two old guys um, not sinking. <laughs> But then we went further south, and sure enough, you can see how the Dead Sea is being mined for the various chemicals that are, that are there. Will it ever disappear? Because it's in the Rift Valley that runs all the way from, up from Africa, probably not. Probably won't disappear simply because it's still about 1,200 feet deep, even though it's shrunk this much. So this is the countryside as we headed south of the Dead Sea. And eventually we got to the very tip of Israel at a place called Eilat, and we crossed the border into Egypt. So part of the trip was also being in Egypt. We were in Egypt about 300 yards because we stayed at a resort hotel in Egypt that was just across the border. And I asked... Uh, uh, Nabil, how come we, we went into Egypt for this? And he said, well, um, it was so much cheaper <laughs> in Egypt than, than staying in Eilat. But we spent a day at this resort, and this is the Red Sea that comes up to the Gulf of Aqaba. And this just gives you an idea of how thorough the border is here. I mean, it took us an hour and a half to get through the border because there were five checks going out, five checks going in. Um, they are very particular about who goes where between the border of Egypt and Israel. This is, uh, this is what the hotel looked like. And uh, we were there in the middle of the week and hardly anybody else was there. Now, they told us that it would be packed come the weekend, but when we were there, we pretty much had the place to ourselves. We went on a glass bottom boat tour that uh, saw the different kinds of coral that were in the Red Sea. Here's an example of looking down the glass bottom boat. Uh, there I am trying to part the Red Sea. I was unsuccessful. <laughs> it was a futile attempt. Uh, and then on the way back the next day, we went up to Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And so to give you an idea of where we were, uh, this is where the resort was, down here at the tip. Uh, we, Masada was at this point, and Qumran is way up here, pretty close to Jericho, as a matter of fact. The Essenes were the group of people at the Qumran settlement, and they were the ones whose scrolls were then uh, discovered in 1947. But again, you look at this area, and it's just desolate, just desolate. This is a picture of the cave. It's the same picture, really, uh, where the first group of sc scrolls were found. And as the story goes, there was a shepherd boy who had lost one of his animals, whether it was a sheep or goat, I'm not sure. But he was trying to find it, he threw a rock up into that cave, and instead of hearing the squeal of a sheep that had hit, been hit by a rock, he heard the sound of breaking pottery. Oh. And he went up there and, and found uh, the, the scrolls. This gives you an idea of the kind of jar that they would have been in, and what they would look like. They're fragmentary, by and large. All of the book of Isaiah has been found. Portions of every other book of the Old Testament has been found other than the book of Esther. There's no uh, record of the book of Esther in the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
Why are they so important? Prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest documents we had of the Old Testament in Hebrew, the oldest, were from about 1100 A.D. Um, the Leningrad Codex, as it was called. Um, when this was discovered, it pushed back the years of, of, uh, text, uh, of text back to, well, about 1,200 years, because... Uh, you're, you're now looking at fragments that would come from about 100 B.C. Now you think, okay, now we're going to find out all the changes that were made, right? <laughs> and that was the amazing thing. Very, very minor, insignificant changes. 1,200 years of copying. And, you know, the differences were just minuscule. Okay. Again, these are pictures of what the community's housing looked like. They were an ascetic community. This is a mikvah, or a special ritual bath. The, the Essenes were very... Well, they really believed in ritual baths. What they didn't have was a lot of water. And uh, so this was a problem. The problem is, is that those baths would... You, they didn't drain them after every use. I mean, they kept using the same water over and over again for months before they could empty it and they could do it. So you were ritually clean. You weren't necessarily bacterially clean. But they did have a water capture system that was quite elaborate. So did Masada in order to gather whatever rainfall did come in into cisterns. And this is Jericho, what it looks like today. Um, a lot of these uh, homes in the Palestinian area would be half done. Um, we, we saw one where somebody was living on the second floor, but the first and the third were not in use, and there was still the rye bar sticking up because they were planning to build it further. That's because you only built, you don't get a loan, you only build as much as you have money to pay for at that moment. And that's how you would do it in an Islamic situation. Uh, this is my friend Bill Vlock as he's on top of a camel. Uh, uh, okay. And we did get to see sheep and goats uh, being shepherded down a valley. Uh, there's a place called the Mount of Temptation. We went back to Bethlehem that night and had a magnificent feast. I know we're running out of time here. We're at Caesarea uh, Maritima now, and this is just below Haifa. And so we we're at a place built by Herod the Great. And uh, what's important about this particular stone, this is a, a model of a stone that's now in a temple, or uh, museum in, in Turkey. But it, uh, it has the name Pontius Pilate on it. You, know, you go back into the 16, 1700s, liberal critics of the Bible were saying Pontius Pilate was some fictional character. The good news is fictional characters don't dedicate buildings that they build. And here we have the name of Pontius Pilate on a stone for a portion of a palace in Caesarea Maritima that he, uh, that he dedicated. And um, this is actually part of a hippodrome, which would be a chariot racing course. Now, uh, several centuries later, they, somebody built into the chariot race course, which is, you know, then you can't use it anymore, but it was uh, circular going around that way. Gives you an idea of, uh, and it's right by the, right by the Mediterranean. Okay. There you have an aqueduct that brought water into the city of Caesarea Maritima. Okay. Now we're on the Mount Carmel. What happened on Mount Carmel? Uh, Elijah and the 400 or 450 prophets of Baal. So this is the site where that took place. And a nice statue of uh, Elijah. Then we went into Haifa. I'm speeding up here because I know we're running mm -hmm. out of time. <clears throat> and Every once in a while, we'd run into some of Nabil's relatives. <laughs> and one of his relatives, a cousin, ran this uh, falafel shop. So we, we had lunch at the falafel shop, operating. Unfortunately, there were 40 of us and only four chairs in the falafel <laughs> shop. So 
most of us found ourselves eating out there on the street. Uh, but the falafels were great, and now I really appreciate those. I haven't had them before, and, and now I wouldn't mind having one for lunch today. If you know of a falafel shop anywhere near Twin Lakes. Mall of America. Mall of America, yeah. yeah. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the house where Nabil um, lived when he was a small child. There's about four rooms in the house. Then his family uh, moved to a, another residence. In Haifa, there is the main temple for the Baha'i faith. If you've ever heard of Baha'i? Uh, um, anyway, that's, it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a group that, that believes that there have always been great prophets and Jesus and Zoroaster and Muhammad, and they're all going to be uh, equally worshipped and, and adored. And so it's very uh, eclectic. And this shows you how modern the city of Haifa is. Then the next day we went to Megiddo, which is in the Jezreel Valley. It's, uh, in, in Hebrew it would be Har Megiddo, or it's Armageddon. If you've ever heard of Armageddon, or, okay, the uh, place mentioned for a, a last and final battle. And <clears throat> my wife didn't want to go on this trip, by the way, because she said, it's all just a bunch of rocks. And uh, to some degree, she was correct. <laughs> Once you've seen one set of ruins, you pretty well have seen all the sets of ruins in terms of how they look to an untrained, non-archaeological eye. They all look pretty much the same. But Megiddo was one of the great fortresses of, of Solomon. Um, thousands of chariots and horses were there at Megiddo. They have models of this. The rocks on the left are mangers, which would be used to feed the horses. Um, and these are all the stables up on top of this large hill. And you can see the view that you have from Megiddo of the Jezreel Valley. Why was this an important military site? It's because if you control Megiddo, you could control the Jezreel Valley. And the Jezreel Valley is the only really decent farming land that I saw on our trip. It had this huge silo. Now, they don't build silos up, they build them down. And so this is a huge silo. That gives you an idea. They, um, they put this here so we have an idea of how the horses would be cared for for the chariots. And they had a special water system in order to defend itself so if they were ever uh, under siege they could still get water. And they did that by building a uh, shaft down and then a tunnel underneath to a spring. So naturally you had to walk down the <laughs> shaft and along the tunnel to the spring. Then we went to Nazareth and this is known as Mary's Well. And then this is the Greek Orthodox Church of the, Annunciate, of the Annunciation. This is where the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary in order to announce to her that she was the chosen to bear the Christ child. And this is the Church of the, um, the Greek Orthodox. And they have a special site where they believe this would have taken place. Um, however, the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Catholics have a different site where they believe it to be and they have built a huge church on that site. And that's where we're going next. At that site, there's, it's, it's really all dedicated to Mary. And, um, did I put this in? Oh, I did. Um, the reason that Dr. Firetog is uh, having this reaction to the statue is, <laughs> is that uh, if you look closely, Mary is stepping on something in this picture, and she's stepping on a serpent. Now, what's the problem? Um, in Genesis 3.15, who is it that's going to crush the head of the serpent? Christ. 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 Who isn't going to crush the head of the serpent? Mary. Mary. But this statue actually has Mary crushing the head of the serpent, which... Oops, well, it's, it's the extent that uh, the honor or even worship that's given to Mary goes. This is the church that's built at the site 
by the Roman Catholics that they believe it happened. And it happens down here in a little cavern underneath. This is the basement of the church, and there's the cavern. This is the upper part of the church, which is, again, huge and elaborate. And there are depictions of Mary from countries all, from countries all over the world that is in a courtyard and inside as well. Um, the picture on the right is above the altar. The picture on the left is the picture of Mary that was given by uh, Roman Catholics from the United States. And it really is kind of scary because it's got this three-dimensional metallic looking Mary coming out from the wall amidst this rather flaming and fiery area. So it, it looks like Mary actually coming in judgment. Then, uh, Then we went to um, Cana, where the wedding at Cana took place. And this is a chapel that was built at that site. And this is where I had the chance to lead a devotion at the wedding at, at, uh, at Cana. Do any of you know what this picture on the left might be? It's a sundial. Wow. Really? So you need... Uh, Water jars that could fill 20 or to 30 firkin, whatever that is, you know, as it mentions it. And so in, there at uh, Cana, they actually have one of these huge, enormous jars. And they're large enough that you just don't move these around very often, <laughs> not unless you absolutely have to. The next day, we went to a place called Beth Sheyan, which was a 4th century Roman city that's there, and it gave us the best idea of what uh, Roman cities would look like. And you can see the different artifacts that are there. This would have been the main street, the Market Street, with shops on either side. Mall of America, early, yeah. early days of Mall of America. <laughs> and then at the distance you see the tell, where the, uh, the rest of the town would have been built in there, and, and they're continuing to dig down to find out what's underneath that tell. And here's uh, Pastor Noor <laughs> attempting to lift one of the pillars. He was unsuccessful. Put it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's Pastor Noor before the hernia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there, again, at Beth Shean, there was a beautiful theater, uh, the remnants of a theater. And oftentimes, these are still used today, these uh, amphitheaters that were built by the Romans. This is the Jordan River. It's at a place where a lot of people, where the tourists go. It's not necessarily where the baptism of Jesus would have taken place. In fact, people know that that's not the area, but it's a good place where the tourists can gather. And so we're there, and, and while we were there, Pastor Noor said he's a foot washer, and so he washed all of our feet one at a time in the Jordan River. You know, some people go there and they get rebaptized. Well, Lutherans don't get rebaptized. No. Mm -mm. You know, that's, that's not something we would do. But getting our feet washed, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. And then we had fish from the Sea of Galilee. And that's one before and that's one after. <laughs> and then we went up to Mount Tabor. This is a church on the top of Mount Tabor. And what's believed to happen that is this is where the transfiguration traditionally would have happened is on Mount Tabor. And this is the site, you know, it, this is a pretty high hill. In fact, this is seen from Nazareth looking at Mount Tabor. And uh, so yeah, this, this, is, this is Peter, James, and John. Those are the three who went <laughs> up with Jesus to the transfiguration on Mount Tabor. <laughs> Then we went to the play, a place called Mount of Precipice, or the Leaping Mountain. And this is about two miles outside of what would have been downtown Nazareth during Jesus' day. And you just look at how high Nazareth is up on the hills, looking down. You remember in that, in the, the, Jesus reads in the, uh, in the synagogue, and then he says, this is, this is fulfilled in your hearing. And the people get mad at him and they're going to take him and throw him off the precipice, this would have been the place they feel that they would have taken him. And I can tell you, it would have worked. <laughs> if you want to get rid of somebody, you throw them off that hill, you're going to get rid of them. Um, again, you just look at the edge of that cliff and what's down below. 
but again, you're, you're looking at uh, some of the best looking farmland that I saw the whole trip. Really, that Jezreel Valley is really something. The next day, we went to Caesarea Philippi. And that's where we began, remember, when I read from Matthew? So, this is the temple behind which there was this large cave that was known as the Gates of Hades. So when Jesus is saying the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, we know that has its own meaning for us, but on the day when he spoke that, he could use that as his illustration. And there you have a picture of what it looks like today. This cave is behind the rock there. And these are little niches. Then we went to the Golan Heights, and from where we were parked on the Golan Heights at this point, you can see all the listening equipment, and so they told us that from here, this is how the, uh, the, the Israel military can listen in to find out what they're having for breakfast in Damascus. <laughs> and then looking the other direction from where our bus was parked, we were looking down at what they were seeing was a park that was, uh, that this park was celebrating the volcanic nature of the topography in that area and how much the ancient volcanoes were involved in forming the landforms that you have. And so that's what this is supposed to be. I looked at that and said, no, those are very poorly disguised missile silos. <laughs> that, that's just what it looks like to me at least. Then we went to Capernaum and uh, there's a house there that they, the remains of a house that they feel were actually Peter's house. And of course, this time they did not build a church in which, uh, well, what they did this time was they built a church over the house without touching any of it. And so what you see there is a church built over, <laughs> and this is the house underneath the church. Um, which could very well, and there are some signs of that it was used as a worship center, and it's right there in Capernaum, and it could very well have been a home of Peter. This is the synagogue in Capernaum, and uh, this part of the synagogue was built after the time of Jesus. These are the foundation stones that would have been there when Jesus would have been in the Capernaum synagogue. And this is some other pictures of the city of Capernaum itself. Then we went to the Dead Sea, uh, the Red the Sea of Galilee, and uh, there are my feet in the Sea of Galilee, and here are worn out travelers. We've been doing this for days now, and we're just getting worn out. Um, beautiful uh, area around the Sea of Galilee, and of course, then we're on a boat on the Sea of Galilee. And after being on the Sea of Galilee for about 30 minutes, the, uh, the tour guide knew that we'd be getting bored, so we got dancing instead. <laughs> This gives you an idea of all the various kinds of food and colors that were involved in the food, and these are what the meals looked like all the time. But remember, I did not get sick. Why didn't I get sick? Rice. Chicken and rice. I ate the chicken and rice, and uh, <laughs> I just wonder what some of that stuff would have tasted like. I'm sure I really missed out, I'm sure. But, but I have to be careful in the United States what I eat. I don't want to get over there and feel sick. And uh, Lorraine, one of our members of the tour, celebrated her 80th birthday. Wow. She doesn't look 80. She no. does not look no. 80. At, no, she doesn't look at 80 at all, but she celebrated her 80th birthday there um, in Nazareth. And this is a group of us that got together in the evenings and played hearts. <laughs> and Lorraine was one of the better hearts players, too. <laughs> to tell you that. The next day, then Tuesday, day 13, we got back on the bus at 4 a.m. in order to get to the airport, and then flew in the reverse direction, and then we were back home. So that was the trip to Israel. Wow, How long was it? Two weeks? It was uh, from September 19th to October 1st. We got back to the U.S. on October 1st. So yeah, it was about 13 days. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, yeah well. Did you say that was a sufficient time to tour, or was that, in your opinion, was that too long? Or? Um, it, what was nice is that we had that day right in the center when we were at the resort in Egypt to rest. Okay. And that's what we did. We just hung out on the beach and just rested. 
And that was really, really nice. That's why I think we were able to get along so well. Because we were not a group of young people. Uh, we, we really weren't. I, I was probably one of the younger. There was a one, one couple on the tour who were probably in their mid-30s, but that was our youth group. <laughs> and, yeah, it was just a wonderful, wonderful trip to be on. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a long enough tour to be a tourist. When we spent 10 weeks in Germany, we were there long enough to actually get an idea of what it would be like to live there. Because we had to learn enough of the language to get to the grocery store. We had to know, learn how to drive. We had to learn how to run the, use the U-Bahn, the S-Bahn, and, and the other train systems. So that, that, that but we weren't going to spend 10 weeks in Israel. That, OK, well, let's just close with the benediction. And again, I thank you very much for your attention as uh, you spent the morning here at, at home. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Thank you.